We're going to move on now to talk about the analysis of stationary or non-stationary data. Now, the material that we're going to cover now is usually not present in most introductory level econometrics courses. However, as we'll see, if we analyse non-stationary data inappropriately, then we can end up with some very serious consequences for our regression model and some very serious problems. Now, before we actually start uh, to talk about what is uh, stationarity and non-stationarity, what are the problems with non-stationary data and analysing it, I first of all want to give you a very vague definition of what non-stationarity versus stationarity are. Uh, it won't be an algebraic precise definition, indeed there are many definitions that exist in practice. All I'm going to do instead is appeal to some uh, intuition. Then we'll have a look at some examples of stationary versus non-stationary processes and then finally after that we'll go through some algebra and then we can state more explicitly what we mean by a series that is stationary or non-stationary. So first of all what do we mean by the word stationary? Well, we can think of a stationary series as one which has the following characteristics. So we could say a stationary series uh, will, uh, first of all, have a constant mean and variance. And secondly, uh, a kind of corollary or side point following that is that a stationary series will cross its mean value frequently. So, as I said, this is not an algebraic definition of stationarity, and nor is it a very precise definition, but it will do for now. So, if we examine a series and it appears to have a constant mean of variance, and it appears to cross its mean value frequently, then very roughly speaking or loosely speaking, we can say that that series is probably stationary. If, on the other hand, the series seems to have a mean that's changing across the sample or a variance that's changing across the sample and uh, that series doesn't cross its mean value very frequently, then it's probably the case that the series is a non-stationary one. Now, we should add before we go on that the uh, analysis of stationary versus non-stationary data is only an issue in the context of time series data used in time series regressions. So if we're using cross-sectional data, we don't need to worry about the issue of whether the data are stationary or not. So, uh, first of all, before we actually look more uh, formally at uh, models for non-stationary and stationary data, let's have a look at a few sample plots which give us some intuition and some ideas about what stationary and non-stationary series might look like. So the first plot I show you is the plot for what's called a white noise process. Now a white noise process um, again could be defined very precisely and technically but loosely speaking a white noise process is a completely random series, that it's, it's one with no structure. So for example in order to generate this series I could have taken separate random drawers from some distribution like a normal distribution and plotted uh, the values of those drawers against the observation number. So let's suppose that the series looked like this. Uh, if we think, if, if, we, if we examine this series and we look at it in the context of whether it seems to have these two characteristics or not, I think clearly we would say that this does indeed look like a stationary series. First of all, if we split that sample in half, for example, we looked at the first 250 observations and calculated their mean and variance and we uh, looked at the second uh, half of the data and calculated its mean and variance, we would see that the mean and the variance look to be roughly the same. They don't seem to be systematically changing through the sample. Secondly, uh, if we look at this series, it does seem to be the case that this series is crossing its mean value, which in fact in this case is zero, uh, very frequently. So because the mean and the variance seem to be roughly constant and this series is crossing its mean value very frequently, we would categorise this as being uh, an example of a stationary series. Now note that a series doesn't have to be a white noise process in order for it to be classed as stationary. In fact, a series can be classed as stationary even if it has many types of dynamic structure. Uh, and there are many models in economics and finance uh, where the data would be classed as being stationary but where we wouldn't say the data were completely random. In other words, there was no structure at all. But we'll come back to that point a bit later on. 
If we now look uh, at another uh, plot, uh, the second plot which we examine is for a random walk which is given by the blue line and a random walk with drift which is given by the kind of pinky purpley line. If we look at these two lines now and again ask ourselves the question, does this look like sets of stationary or non-stationary data in terms of these characteristics here, then I think we'd argue in this case that these look like non-stationary data. First of all, do these series look as if they've got a constant mean? Well, the answer to that question is clearly no. If we were, again, to split the data roughly in half and uh, calculate the mean of the, of the first 250 observations and then separately calculate the mean of the last 250 observations for both the random walk and the random walk with drift, we would see that the mean of those two sets of observations would be quite different. The mean for the first half of the sample would be quite low, maybe 5 or 10, and the mean for the second half for the random walk with drift might look like it's about 20. Uh, sorry, for the random walk it might be around 20. For the random walk with drift the mean might be 40. So clearly those two series don't have a constant mean through time. Similarly, if we examine the second characteristic that I suggested, in other words, do these series cross their mean value frequently? Again, the answer in both cases is no. Uh, if we looked at the mean for the whole series in the context of the random walk with drift, that is the pink line, the mean for the whole series looks as if it's about 25. How many times uh, does this series cross its mean value of 25 through the sample? Well, the answer is it only crosses its mean value once. So because this series... Uh, for both the random walk and the random walk with drift seem to have uh, a mean that's not constant through the sample and they don't cross their mean value very frequently, we would categorise both of these as being non-stationary series. Now, uh, these are both examples of one particular type of non-stationary series. Uh, and the particular type of non-stationarity that we have here is what we might call stochastic non-stationarity. So, we could say that there are two uh, broad types of non-stationarity. Two types of non-stationarity. Uh, the first type is uh, this type which I've just talked about here, the random walk and the random walk with drift, which we could call stochastic uh, non-stationarity. Now we call this stochastic non-stationarity because it turns out that the source of the non-stationarity, in fact, is the disturbance term in the equation for this non-stationary series. I'll come back to that a bit later on. But, but for the time being, all we need to know is that for this particular type of non-stationarity, the source of the non-stationarity is actually a random factor that affects the model. Notice that both the random walk and the random walk with drift are examples of stochastic non-stationary series. So whether a series has a, a positive or negative or zero drift in doesn't affect whether it's stationary or not. Uh, what about the other type of non-stationarity? Well, the other type of non-stationarity, uh, which is given in the, in the next plot, is uh, sometimes known as uh, deterministic. Deterministic non-stationarity. Now, for a deterministically uh, non-stationary process, uh, the source of the non-stationarity will be uh, a deterministic uh, linear trend. So, in this plot, what we've got is a positive deterministic linear uh, upward sloping trend uh, and random fluctuations around that trend. So, uh, you can clearly see that the type of uh, non-stationarity that we've got is very, very different. In the uh, previous slide, the uh, random walk and the random walk with drift had a tendency to kind of wander for long periods of time upwards, then they would wander downwards for a while. For, uh, for the deterministic source of non-stationarity, on the other hand, there is no such phenomenon of wandering up and then wandering down. There's clearly an underlying upward sloping straight line trend and then random fluctuations about that trend. So clearly these two are very different types of non-stationarity, although it turns out that they would lead to the same problems in regression analysis. If we were to now ask ourselves the question, which of these two types of non-stationarity, the deterministic trend non-stationarity, 
or the stochastic non-stationarity, if we were to ask ourselves the question, which of these two types of non-stationarity best describes series uh, in economics and finance that are of interest to us, then hopefully it's clear if we've ever plotted any non-stationary series over time that not many series look like this. That is, there aren't really any series in economics or finance when we plot them that appear to have a deterministic trend. So uh, it turns out that this type of non-stationarity exists as a theoretical model, as a theoretical way to describe the features of a set of data, but in practice we won't actually use uh, this type of model to, to analyse our series because it simply doesn't describe any series in economics and finance. On the other hand, the stochastic non-stationarity model is a very, very useful one in economics and finance. It turns out that almost all series in economics and finance, when we take them in their levels forms, uh, exhibit this type of stochastic non-stationarity. So for example, if we look to asset prices like exchange rates, uh, equity prices, bond prices and so on, uh, if we looked at GDP, unemployment, uh, consumer prices, uh, money supply, many, many variables taken in their kind of raw levels form like this would uh, be described very accurately as stochastic non-stationary series. And that being the case, we can uh, model them in this particular type of way. And if we plotted them over time, they would look very much like a random walk or a random walk with drift. Now, we'll come back in a moment to the uh, particular econometric models that we use to describe these two types of non-stationarity. But for now, what I want to do is to explain what would be the problems if we analyse non-stationary data in their levels forms. So what are the problems if we analyse non-stationary data in their levels forms and why is it important that we think very carefully about whether our series are non-stationary or not? Well, it turns out that uh, the characteristics of non-stationary series are very different to the characteristics of stationary series. And the first characteristic of non-stationary series is that shocks or disturbances to non-stationary series will be persistent through time. We'll examine this algebraically in a moment or two, but for now we can think of the word shock being synonymous with the word disturbance or error. And uh, if uh, a stationary series is subject to an exogenous or random shock or disturbance, then the impact of that shock will gradually be dissipated or will gradually damp down through time. On the other hand, for a stationary series, the impact of a shock at a given time will not damp down uh, as we track that shock through the series into the future. So uh, stationary and non-stationary series have very different properties in terms of the impact that a shock or disturbance will have. Clearly that's, this has an important implication for policy analysis because, for example, if unemployment is uh, a non-stationary variable, then uh, a shock to unemployment will persist in that unemployment series forever. It will never disappear. The second and most serious uh, problem with analysing non-stationary data in their raw or levels forms is the idea or concept of spurious regression. The idea essentially is this. If we were to take two series uh, which are completely unrelated to one another and regress one on the other, we would expect that the R-squared from that regression would be very close to zero. In other words, uh, the slope uh, for that regression uh, estimation would have a t-ratio that was not significantly different from zero. That's what we would expect because the two variables are not related to one another. And that is what we would find if the two variables were stationary. But if the two variables are non-stationary and we regress one non-stationary variable on the other, quite often uh, we end up finding a very high value of R squared from that regression and a very significant T ratio on the slope in that regression even if the two variables Y and X in fact were totally unrelated to one another. This is why we call this spurious regression. Clearly in this case we will have found a statistically significant regression relationship but this regression relationship is just a statistical artefact. It's not a genuine relationship because the two series were uh, not related to one another. 
Uh, the regression uh, equation in that context simply picks up the fact that the two series have trends in and this is what causes the R squared sometimes to be high and uh, the T ratios to sometimes be significant. One implication of this uh, con constitutes the third problem of analysing non-stationary data in their levels form. That is, if the dependent variable and indeed any of the independent variables are non-stationary, then we could show that the usual assumptions for asymptotic theory to be validly applied don't hold. One implication of that is that test statistics no longer follow the distributions that we said they would. So T-ratios no longer follow a T-distribution, F-test statistics no longer follow an F-distribution, chi-squared test statistics no longer follow a chi-squared distribution. So uh, if we have non-stationary data and we try to make statistical inferences based on models estimated using that data, then we can run into serious problems. Specifically, uh, the T-ratios will not follow a T-distribution. The actual distribution of T-ratios in the context of non-stationary data will have much fatter tails than they otherwise would have done. This means the probability of type 1 error is much greater in practice than the nominal significance level that we assumed. So, for example, if we use a 5% significance level, we'd expect to make a type 1 error 5% of the time by chance alone. But, if we use non-stationary data, we can end up making a type 1 error a much higher percentage of the time than that. Maybe sometimes as high as 80 or even 90% of the time, we'll find a statistically significant relationship uh, even when there, there isn't one. So if we were to examine, uh, using some plots, uh, what the impact of these spurious regressions are, what I've done here is to uh, estimate a thousand separate regressions uh, where I regress one non-stationary time series on another non-stationary time series and in fact these two non-stationary time series followed independent random walks so I took one random walk uh, for Y and regressed it on another random walk for X um, and uh, I calculated the value of R squared and the value of the T ratio for uh, each of these 1000 separate regressions if we look at the value of R squared, as I said, what we would hope is that because Y and X are not related to one another, because I've constructed them completely independently of one another, we'd expect the R squared for every one of those regressions to be very close to zero. Obviously, the R squareds in practice are never going to be exactly zero, because there'll always be some non-zero, but hopefully negligible, i.e. very small correlation between the variables X and Y. But in the context of non-stationary data, we can see that the distribution of values of R squared is actually very, very fat-tailed on the right-hand side. So we've got a very large upper tail of R squared values. And we can see uh, for uh, about 40 or 50 out of these 1,000 uh, separate regressions that I've conducted, we got a value of R squared that was higher than 75%. These are truly enormous values of R squared for a regression model where the two variables are completely independent of one another. If we now uh, look at a similar plot for the values of the T ratios, again, if these were two stationary series where I'd regress one on the other and calculated the value of the T ratio for the slope coefficient, we would expect that T ratio to follow a T distribution. In other words, we would expect uh, values of these T ratios that were bigger than 2 in absolute value uh, roughly 5% of the time. So I'd expect roughly 25 out of the 1,000 samples to have T ratios bigger than 2 and roughly 25 out of the 1,000 samples to have T ratios smaller than minus 2. But if we look at this plot, what we find is that the distribution has much, much fatter tails than uh, it should do we can see that there are enormous numbers of replications, and that is, enormous numbers of these 1,000 uh, simulation trials that I've done, where the values of the T ratios are truly enormous. Uh, they can be as high as 250, 500, even some of them are, are up to 1,000. And the number of uh, replications, that is, the number of uh, my 1,000 trials where the T ratio is bigger than 2 in absolute value is truly huge. In fact, it's for well over half the sample.
So clearly here we can see that this T ratio doesn't follow a T distribution anymore because the data are non-stationary and this characterises what we call the problem of spurious regression. So if we were to now uh, come back to some models for our non-stationary data, we would have two different types of model, one for the uh, stochastically non-stationary series and one for the deterministically non-stationary series. Now if we first of all look at the stochastically non-stationary series, uh, of which the random walk and random walk with drift are examples, then a good equation to represent those would be yt equals mu plus yt minus 1 uh, plus ut. So ut is just a standard uh, regression disturbance term, which we assume to have the same properties uh, that we always assume the disturbance term to have. Mu in this equation 1 is simply a parameter which measures the size of the drift uh, and uh, we have a kind of regression of y on its previous value with uh, a unit slope coefficient, if you like. So this is the way that we would write out a model for the random walk with drift. Obviously for the random walk with no drift, the value of mu would be zero. If we then look at the deterministic trend process described by equation 2, then we can see that we would need a very different uh, type of equation to represent that. And a good equation to represent a deterministic trend process is something like yt equals alpha plus beta t plus ut. In that context, uh, alpha would represent an intercept. Okay, we, we couldn't interpret it as a drift in this context, uh, we, that would simply measure the value that y took uh, at observation zero, if you like. And the letter t uh, makes up the linear time trend. So t is the time index which takes the values 1 for the first observation, 2 for the second observation, 3 for the third observation, and so on and so on, up to capital T for the last observation. And uh, this is what makes up that upward sloping trend in the series. So once again in that expression too, ut is an ordinary, a, a standard disturbance term. So uh, those are the two expressions that we would use to uh, model, if you like, the two types of non-stationarity. The stochastic non-stationarity in the first case and the deterministic non-stationarity in the second case. What we're going to do now is to focus our attentions really on the stochastic form of non-stationarity. The reason that we do that, as I said, is that uh, many, many series in economics and finance can be described ad accurately as stochastically non-stationary series. But there aren't any series, as far as I'm aware, in economics or finance that could be described by deterministically non-stationary series. Uh, now, uh, we could think of the random walk with drift as being uh, one special case of what we might call an autoregressive model of order one. So if we were to write out the autoregressive model of order one, it might look uh, as follows. So uh, the model is called the uh, autoregressive model of order one, and we would write that model as yt equals uh, mu if we wanted to uh, include an intercept or drift term in here, plus phi or phi, uh, yt minus 1, uh, plus ut. So this would be called an autoregressive model of order 1, because essentially the word auto obviously means self, and we're conducting a kind of regression here. So we'd have an autoregressive model if we regress the current value of y on its previous values. Obviously this is a model of order 1, because we're regressing the current value of y just on one previous value. And essentially, determining whether a series is stochastically non-stationary or we can think of it being stationary is uh, essentially determined by the value of the phi coefficient in this regression. So we can think of uh, the value of phi taking on uh, one of three values uh, of interest to us. The first possibility is that phi is bigger than 1. The second possibility is that phi equals 1. The third possibility is that phi is less than 1. And in a moment, we'll examine algebraically what the implication of phi taking each of these values would be and what that means for our series. But just for now, 
uh, we could note that uh, a value of phi bigger than 1 would be characteristic of what we would call an explosive process. So uh, phi bigger than 1 is an explosive process for y. Now, it turns out once again that phi bigger than 1 doesn't describe many series in economics or finance because there aren't many series that are explosive. Why we use the word explosive we'll come to in a moment. Uh, but for now, as I said, there are these three possibilities for the value that phi could take. If we now do some, some algebra using that expression, it turns out that it's much easier for us to work with that expression if we set the drift term mu to zero. So let's specify mu equals zero, or equivalent to that, we could be assuming that the series y has a zero mean. So we get rid of the uh, drift, and then we have an autoregressive model of order 1 with no intersect in, in that equation. If that expression holds for y at time t, if we assume that this equation is structurally stable through time, then obviously we could also write that expression out for time t minus 1 and for time t minus 2. So we could subtract 1 away from all the time subscripts in equation 1, and then we would have yt minus 1 equals phi yt minus 2 plus ut minus 1. We could then subtract another 1 from all the time subscripts, and we'd have yt minus 2 equals phi yt minus 1 plus ut minus 2. What we can then do is, we've got an expression for yt minus 1, and we could substitute into the right-hand side of expression 3 here, at the top of the side, uh, in order to get an expression where uh, yt minus 1 has been removed. So uh, yt equals phi yt minus 1 plus ut. If we substitute in for, ut, uh, for yt minus 1, then what do we get? We get yt equals phi multiplied by phi yt minus 2 plus ut minus 1 plus ut. If we then expand out the parentheses in that expression, we get yt equals phi squared yt minus 2 plus phi uh, ut minus 1 plus ut. We've now got an expression that does not involve yt minus 1 on the right-hand side, but only involves yt minus 2. We previously set up an expression for yt minus 2, so we could then use that expression to substitute in for yt minus 2 and get an expression that doesn't involve yt minus 2 and only involves yt minus 3. So if we now substitute in for yt minus 2, what do we get? We get yt equals... Uh, phi squared multiplied by, open brackets, phi yt minus 3 plus ut minus 2, close brackets, plus phi ut minus 1 uh, plus ut. If we expand out those parentheses, we end up with yt equals phi cubed yt minus 3 plus phi squared ut minus 2 plus phi ut minus 1 plus ut. Hopefully you can already see a pattern emerging in this algebra that we're doing. Uh, every time we make a substitution, we add in another lag term in U, and we end up with still one term in the lagged Y, but that lag becomes further uh, into the past for Y by one period. If we did that substitution capital T times, okay, until we ended up kind of coming right back to our sample, then we'd end up with the expression yt equals phi to the power capital T multiplied by y0, where y0 is our kind of initial or very first value of y, plus phi ut minus 1, plus phi squared ut minus 2, plus phi cubed ut minus 3, and so on and so on, plus phi to the t multiplied by u0 where u0 was our very first disturbance, plus ut. We can then examine what happens in, in this expression uh, for each of the values of phi that we're interested in. So we can say, what will the properties of our series y be in terms of what happens with the shocks or disturbances if the value of phi is bigger than 1, if the value of phi equals 1, or if the value of phi is less than 1? And those are the three cases that we're interested in. First of all, if we look at what happens when the value of phi is bigger than 1, which I said is explosive process. Well, if the value of phi is bigger than 1, that means phi squared will be bigger than phi, phi cubed will be bigger than phi squared, phi to the t will be bigger than phi t to the power t minus 1, and so on. If that's the case, what that means is we are attaching increasing weight 
to each of these disturbances or shocks as we go further back into the past. So in other words, we could say, in the context of an explosive process, that uh, shocks or disturbances have an increasing impact on the current value of y the further they are into the past. So if we're looking at some series y, and we're going to track it into the future now, if uh, that series y has some shock or disturbance that affects it today, then it will, if y is an explosive process, that shock uh, today will have a bigger impact tomorrow than it did today, it will have a bigger impact the day after tomorrow than it did tomorrow, and so on. Uh, clearly, that's not a very satisfactory, because, for example, if there's a, a shock to stock prices today, for example, uh, somebody dropped a bomb on the London Stock Exchange and the exchanges were closed or trading had to be moved somewhere else temporarily, we wouldn't expect the impact on the FTSE index to be bigger tomorrow than it is today, and then to be bigger the day after tomorrow than it is tomorrow, and so on. That really doesn't make any sense. So uh, this explosive process, uh, we, we rule out in practice on the grounds that it doesn't really make very much sense. What about uh, the case where the value of phi in this autoregressive process of order 1 uh, is equal to 1? So what happens if phi equals 1? Well, if phi equals 1, obviously phi equals phi squared equals phi cubed equals phi raised to the power t. That would be the, 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 the situation where we could view the current value of y as a simple sum or accumulation without any weighting of the previous shocks to y. So if y uh, follows uh, an autoregressive process where the value of phi equals 1, that obviously comes back to the random walk model. Uh, we could say that in that situation, shocks to y will persist through time, but they won't be explosive. They won't be uh, increased through time. The values of those shocks and the impact on y will stay constant through time. So if we're tracking some series y that follows a random walk process, i.e. phi equals 1, then a shock today will have the same impact tomorrow as it has today. It will have the same impact the day after tomorrow as uh, it does tomorrow, and so on. So that being the case, uh, that will still be a non-stationary process, but it will be a slightly different one. So, uh, in fact, because the value of phi is 1 here, we call this uh, a unit root process. So phi equals 1 corresponds to the unit root process. Finally, what happens if the value of phi is less than 1? Well, in that context, if the value of phi is less than 1, obviously phi squared is smaller than phi, phi cubed is smaller than phi squared, phi t is smaller than phi to the t minus 1, and so on and so on. If that's the case, then we've got a stationary process, which is what we want. That is, we've got a situation where shocks will have a smaller impact on the current value of y the further they are into the past. So in other words, if we had a shock to some variable y today and where the value of phi is less than 1, then the impact of the shock tomorrow will be smaller than it is today. The impact of the shock the day after tomorrow will be smaller than it is tomorrow and so on. So we could say phi less than 1 is uh, a stationary process. And as I said, that's what we want to see. So it's important to note that both the explosive process and the unit pro uh, root process are examples of non-stationary processes. So both of these two are non-stationary processes. If phi is bigger than 1 or phi equals 1, then the series y uh, that it's describing would be a non-stationary one. But again, as I said, it turns out that this explosive process isn't a very uh, em empirically useful one for representing the series that are of interest to us. Now, obviously, we know uh, from what I said on previous slides that if we try to analyse non-stationary data in levels forms, then we uh, run into problems. We run into those problems of spurious regression and the test statistics not following the distributions that we said that they would. An obvious question now to ask is, well, given that we know that and we appreciate it, if we have... Uh, a non-stationary series, how can we make it stationary? Okay, how can we make our non-stationary series uh, a stationary one? Well, the answer to that question would depend upon what the type of non-stationarity was. For a unit root, 
non-stationarity, then the appropriate response to uh, finding that our series yt is non-stationary and has a value of phi equal to 1 in this autoregressive representation of order 1 would be to take first differences of y. We learned from a previous lecture how to take first differences. All we would do is take our series of y and subtract from every observation on y uh, the value that y took in the previous period. And usually we will call that new series that we create uh, capital delta yt. So if our original series yt was a unit root uh, non-stationary process, then the series that we construct delta yt would be a stationary process. So we would say that we'd induce stationarity by taking first differences in that case. That would be how we would turn a random walk form of non-stationarity into a stationary process. What would uh, we do, on the other hand, if we got the deterministic form of non-stationarity? So if we've got a deterministic uh, form of non-stationarity, how would we uh, take that series Y, which uh, was a deterministically non-stationary process, and make it stationary? Well, the equation for the deterministically non-stationary process was yt equals alpha plus beta t plus uh, ut. The way that we would create a stationary process from this would be to take the linear regression uh, given by this expression and then essentially uh, take the residuals from that. And then the residuals from that would be a stationary process. So what we would do essentially is uh, take yt and subtract away from it the fitted value, so we do minus alpha hat minus beta hat t, and then that would be equal to the uh, residuals uh, from that estimated equation. And then uh, this uh, new series for y, given by this thing here, would then be a stationary series. Essentially, what we would have done in this context would have been uh, to take the series uh, which had some uh, random fluctuations about the deterministic trend and then we will have subtracted away or removed that deterministic trend from the series so that what we would end up with is a series that just had the random fluctuations left. So by taking our original series, regressing it upon the time uh, trend, then subtracting away the fitted time trend, we end up taking a deterministically uh, non-stationary trend process here, removing the trend, and then we end up just left with the random fluctuations that were uh, around that trend. Obviously, as I said in practice, this is going to be the one that we'll actually focus upon because the unit root form of non-stationarity is much more prevalent in practice. So uh, it might be surprising to people who've never done any econometrics before, but if I took the value of some series y and I regressed it upon its previous value and calculated the value of the estimated coefficient from this regression model, for many, many series, we'd get an estimated value of y, uh, phi, sorry, that's uh, very close to 1. So, as I said, if, if y were a set of equity prices, bond prices, exchange rates, uh, unemployment data, GDP, money supply, uh, any variable that you could name essentially in levels form, if we took the value of y in one period, uh, and regressed it on the value of y in uh, the previous period, we get an estimated slope coefficient uh, very, very close to 1. It might be 1.02, it might be 0.98 or whatever, but it'll be very, very close to 1. And in some ways, for people who've never done econometrics before, that's quite surprising. But if you don't believe me, go and try it. One last thing to say uh, is that I've written all of the equations so far on this material about non-stationary data in the context of some series y. If our regression model that we originally wanted to estimate uh, regressed y on a set of explanatory variables that x is, then what we need to do is to analyse every single series in our regression model separately and determine whether they were stationary or non-stationary. So I would take the value of the dependent variable and regress it on its previous value and calculate the estimated value of phi. Uh, 
and see if it's close to 1. I then take the value of x2 and regress it on its previous value, see if it was close to 1. Take the value of x3, see, uh, regress that on its previous value and see if it was close to 1 and so on and so on. So we need to analyse every single variable in our regression model separately to see whether they're stationary or non-stationary. And if any of the variables were non-stationary, that could give us problems with our regression model.